Welcome everyone to part two of the matter lecture outline. We recently learned about the properties of matter, both physical and chemical, and changes of matter. And now we'd like to discuss in this part two the law of conservation of mass, as well as look at properties or uh, traits of specific mixtures. So we're going to start with a short video right now. The law of conservation of mass states that in a chemical change, matter is neither created nor destroyed. It is only rearranged. For example, let's place five zinc and five sulfur atoms onto the two sides of a pan balance. The two sides balance because the contents of each pan are identical. Consider the reaction of zinc with sulfur atoms on one side of the balance to form zinc sulfide. Five zinc atoms will react with five sulfur atoms with a tremendous release of energy to form five zinc sulfide molecules. The two sides still exactly balance. The total number of zinc and sulfur atoms on each side are still identical, demonstrating the law of conservation of mass. Okay, now having seen this short video on the law of conservation of mass, now what we're going to do is we're going to focus on some specifics as well as talk about properties of mixtures. Now there's a lot of math that we can do with the law of conservation of mass but it's dead simple. It's addition and subtraction and simply stated it just means that mass is neither created nor destroyed during a chemical reaction. Matter or mass is conserved. The picture that you're seeing here is a picture of Antoine Lavoisier with his lovely wife who was also his lab assistant a very famous French chemist who had the great misfortune to be born about the time of the French Revolution and as tax collector and of being a noble birth Anton Lavoisier while he gets credit for a very important law in chemistry died a tragic death under the blade of the guillotine no one likes a tax, tax collector down at the bottom you can see expressed in mathematical form massive products equals massive reactants and essentially what we're saying is whatever number and kinds of atoms you begin with on the left hand side of an equation you have to end up with that same number and kinds of atoms on the right. They might be rearranged and reconfigured into new and different substances but they're all still there and if you have a tightly controlled experiment like you see Antoine Lavoisier's experimental apparatus in the background you'll be able to capture any products that might seemingly disappear and prove the law of conservation of mass or matter. Now the next part of the chapter discusses what we call mixtures. We've, so far we've discussed that there are pure substances like liquids, excuse me, like um, uh, compounds or elements. And what we're looking at here are possible examples of some of those. So if I look at how the liquid is being made in picture B, this cup of tea, we steeped the tea bag in the tea and had the tea particles go into solution in that teacup can't be a pure substance because however long I steep the tea bag will determine different amounts of tea being dissolved and so if the composition isn't uniform it can't be a pure substance. So what it has in common with the other substances is that it's got some liquid water in it but what's different about it is that it is a mixture, a combination of two or more pure substances in which each pure substance retains its individual chemical properties. The mixtures are just physically combined. If Superman was to look at a pure substance, he would see with his superhuman vision only one kind of atom or one kind of molecule. Let's go back to that previous slide. That would be an example of the compound water on the left hand side of the screen. All you would see inside that are H2O molecules, period. And the soup, which is down below the picture of the teacup, that's definitely a mixture as well. Notice that you could have varying amounts of the different vegetables in that soup, so it also is a mixture. It can have a varying composition. And if I wanted to separate out the mixture of soup, I could pick out the carrots and put them in one pile and pick out the broccoli and put them in another pile. I think you get the idea. So we're looking at a flow chart here, and now on this particular part of this uh, PowerPoint, we're going to focus on mixtures. If you do have something like the soup, 
where the mixture parts do not blend smoothly with each other and which the individual substances like the broccoli or the carrots remain distinct, that's called heterogeneous. Hetero means different. And so when you look at this picture, on the left hand side in beaker A, it's a mixture of probably dirt or some clay that they've mixed and stirred and allowed to separate out over time and you can see a distinct layer on the bottom of the solid material that was too heavy to stay in the suspension and so it settled out. But as I look at beaker B, it does look homogeneous throughout and it's difficult to tell right now without further testing, might that be pure water or might that be a solution that's clear like salt or sugar water. There is our heterogeneous mixture. Besides a heterogeneous mixture, you could have a homogeneous mixture. Homo means same. A homogeneous mixture has uniform constant composition throughout. If that was salt water, it would taste salty throughout, no matter where I tasted it. Or as you can see visually, it is clear throughout. It has what we call only a single phase. That's a little confusing. Don't think of that as a phase of matter. Think of it as compared and contrasted to the beaker A on the left. You can't see different layers, for example, and those layers are a phase. No such distinct phases are present in beaker B. This is also called a solution when something is homogeneous. So how could you tell if that truly was a homogeneous mixture? Let's pretend it was salt water. I could, as mentioned in a previous PowerPoint, evaporate away the water and left behind might be the solid solute, in this case salt, which when the water got boiled off was left behind in its, in, in its original form. So all of these things that are coming up on the next picture are either homogeneous or heterogeneous. What would you guess for this rock? A conglomerate kind of rock? If it doesn't look uniform throughout, you're picking heterogeneous. The brass that's in this antique candlestick is a mixture of many metals melted together, blended, and then allowed to cool. And so you can have solids dissolved in other solids, and that's an example of a homogeneous alloy. Clearly, since there's distinct phases in this hamburger, I'm going with heterogeneous mixture. My Kool-Aid, if any of the Kool-Aid colorant or sugar has settled, not settled to the bottom, that is also a uniform, homogeneous mixture. Soda cans are a little bit tricky. If the lid of the can is closed, then I would call that a homogeneous mixture. It's uniformly got syrup, coloring, and CO2 bubbles spread throughout. If, however, you pop the top on the soda, CO2 gas that makes the fizzy bubbles that tickle your nose, it doesn't want to stay in solution, and it would come out of solution and it would probably bubble off and not be seen. However, left behind would still be a homogeneous mixture of the sugary, syrupy, colored part of the soda. Let's think of different types of solutions. Many people think that a solution can only be a solid dissolved in a liquid, for example. But as you've just seen, you could have a solid dissolved in a solid, such as that candlestick made of brass, or you could have a gas dissolved in a liquid, such as the carbonated beverage in the soda. So please don't get locked into thinking that solutions are only solids dissolved in liquids, although those are the most common ones that we're dealing with in this chemistry class. So let's give an example of a homogeneous solution of a solid metal. You're looking at American coins here. These are all alloys. And in fact, a dime is not pure silver. And a copper zinc is, or a copper penny is not really mostly copper. It's got a mostly zinc inside. So you take the two or three metals, you melt them together at high temperatures, mix them so they're uniform, and you've got them cooling to form a solid metal and another solid metal, specifically called an alloy. If I need to separate mixtures, there are a variety of ways to do so. Most importantly, you need to remember that mixtures get separated by physical methods, not chemical methods. You create a mixture through a physical method, you separate them through a physical method. So filtration, as we saw on the walk around, could separate a solid solute 
in this particular case, possibly an insoluble solid like the precipitate from the liquid filtrate, the solution that can pass through, or if it's water, then just the compound of water. So filtration uses a technique with a porous barrier, the filter paper, to separate a solid from a liquid. And here's a picture of a person doing just that. Dirty water, dirt is being held behind in the filter paper, coming through hopefully as clear water. Distillation is a technique that we use when we have a liquid dissolved in another liquid or mixed with another liquid, and we use differences in boiling points to be able to separate the components of a mixture. We heat them up, they boil at different temperatures, as they give off the vapors at their different temperatures, those can be collected and cooled and condensed to turn into a liquid, but it's been purified from the other liquids that are in that mixture. This lovely apparatus and this animation shows what's going on. You might have a mixture here in this container at part two or number two. We're heating it in this heating mantle. This is a boiling flask. Off come the vapors. It passes into this thing called a condensing tube and up until this point it's a gas, but at this point it turns into a liquid because at step four you have cool water not being shown. That's on either side of that interior tube. The cool water enters at five and leaves at step six and as this gas cools it's then collected into a container. Now that's a fairly simple graphic. But on a commercial scale, all you have to do is look across the bay at the towers of Richmond Refinery over at Chevron that you would see how we refine crude oil. So the crude oil is sucked out of the ground, heated, and crude oil, as you can see, contains many different components, all of which have a different boiling point. So the first element or first uh, compound or compo component of that mixture that would come boiling off is petroleum because the petroleum boils at less than 40 degrees Celsius. So it starts to boil, goes through a condenser, gets collected in its own container. Then you have to continue heating this crude oil to get the gasoline to come off. Those are gasoline molecules that have 4 to 12 carbons in the chain. You might notice that the longer and longer and longer the chains of carbon get that make up these hydrocarbons in crude oil, the higher their boiling point is, and so on, where you can get kerosene or jet fuel, excuse me, boiling at 200 to 250 degrees, then the heating oil, then the lubricating oil, and then you're left with the really nasty stuff, that asphalt, carcinogenic, that's got uh, carbons of 25 or higher in their chains. Distillation is a way to separate components of a liquid mixture. Another method is crystallization, where you have the formation of pure solid particles in a substance or from a substance that's dissolved in a solution that contains that substance. Here's a picture of magma cooling. You probably learned about this possibly in integrated science, where we have crystals forming below the crust. We call those intrusive crystals. This is magma crystallizing out, and those that are outside the crust are in extrusive. So crystallization is another technique of separating mixtures. And this is one that might look familiar to you. This is called chromatography. It's a technique that separates the components of a mixture based on their tendency to travel or be drawn across the surface of another material. So this is an example right here. There's a strip of filter paper, chromatography paper, and you can see different colors. So we've expanded it to make it larger and be able to see. And CHLA and B are two different forms of chlorophyll, the pigments in plants that give them the green color. Here's some of those xanthophylls and carotenes that give the pretty oranges and reds that you see in the fall when the chlorophyll dies back, in deciduous plants that is. So what happens is you can put a drop of a mixture at one end of this paper and they travel across the paper, the strip of chromatography paper, at different speeds because some of them are lighter and some are heavier that would be a function of their molar mass, which is something we'll be studying a few chapters from now. The heavier ones can't travel very far because they're moving more slowly than the lighter weight, higher speed molecules that are moving across the paper. 
So that's called chromatography. Sometimes in middle school we do a fun lab where you have black ink that you do paper chromatography with and you can see it being separated into many different pigment colors. So chromatography is another separation technique that you can use and you might have done this lab in integrated science. Okay, I think that's probably a good part to a point to stop part two of the PowerPoint notes in matter. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time at the part three. Take care.